see such a interested audience. <laughs> so on behalf of the museum, we welcome you. I want to say, first of all, that we're grateful to our African American Advisory Committee, Dolores Jackson Foster, George Rutherford, Linda Downing Ballard, Sandra Fidrell, for advising us, making this happen. And so we're grateful to them and to the panelists for agreeing to participate. And we invite you, and we invite you later, if you have time, to go to the gallery to see some exhibits. We've made some strides in recent years in making our exhibits more inclusive of the diver diversity of Jefferson County. So with that, I turn it over to our moderator, Linda Downing Ballard. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. <laughs> the purpose of the program is to learn from the panelists and members of the audience about the experiences of the African American women here in Jefferson County from the 1930s to the 1960s. And we're grateful that they were willing to participate. And each panelist will talk about the area of Jefferson County that they represent. And so we'll start. Um, my name is Brenda Branson. I'm going to speak about the experiences in Shepherdstown, West Virginia, um, the greatest town in Jefferson County. <laughs> I lived on the west end of Shepherdstown. Excuse me, just a minute. I need to get the mic. It's right there. You have to hold it pretty close. <coughs> to your mouth. Amplify. My name is Brenda Branson. Is it on? See, that's why I didn't want to be first. Yeah, I don't blame you. I don't know how to run it. I'll, I'll just try to speak a little louder. My name is Brenda Branson. I'm from Shepherdstown, West Virginia. And in Shepherdstown, I lived on the East End. And in my first um, acknowledgement of who I am, I said that that's the greatest town in, in Shepherd, uh, the greatest town in West Virginia, Shepherdstown. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. My name is Janet Robinson Jeffries. Close your <laughs> My name is Janet Robinson Jeffries. I lived in rural Jefferson County between Charlestown and Griffin. And I'm the product of a tenant farm. Good afternoon. My name is Helen Dolores Jackson Foster. Oh, Helen is my first name. <laughs> I was born and raised in the towns of Bolivar Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. Good afternoon. My name is Alice White Hunter, born and raised in the village of Mount Pleasant, Jefferson County, West Virginia, the metropolitan part. <laughs> Hello, I'm Julia Downing. I was born in 1928. I'm here to represent Charlestown. <laughs> And I thought I was the oldest member of the panel until I realized that Julie was going to be a part of it. I was born in 1938, so she and I have something in common. <laughs> and I also forgot to give you my ear. I'm in the 1950s, 60s. originally asked uh, Ms. Ruth McDaniel, and so um, it's Thursday, I think, when we asked her if she would uh, be one of our panelists. So now each of our panelists will um, 
talk about her life experiences during the 30s through the 1960s. And we're going to ask that, um, well actually, then we're going to go into a discussion among the panelists, and then the audience will be able to ask questions. And so if we would hold our questions until after the panelists have gone over their information. And so we'll start here, Ms. Branson. Okay, where to begin? Um, life in Shepherdstown um, was, uh, for me, I was, I did a very sheltered life, although I did eventually, when I began school, got out into the community. And I'll start with the um, schooling. Um, I went to East Side Elementary School, which was on the east side of town. I lived on the west side, but we had to walk. And I calculated it at about seven tenths of a mile to rain, sleet, hail, snow to school. And the school experience was a great experience. Um, we had that personal attention that I don't think a lot of the kids get now. Uh, the teachers were interested in our in our home life. They were interested in. Uh, making sure that we got everything that they had to offer to help us to move forward in the world. Um, after elementary school, um, that was during the era of integration, and I can remember my eighth grade teacher, he was trying to encourage us to go to um, Shepherdstown um, School in Shepherdstown, the um, white school in Shepherdstown, this is called Shepherdstown High School. Um, and a lot, of the, a lot of the students didn't want to go there, and he sort of did a little uh, intimidation, you know, uh, telling you what, you know, some of the advantages of going there. My reason for going there was because I didn't want to get up at dusk, at dawn, and be out until dusk getting back home, so I chose to go to the Shepherdstown High School. Uh, my experience there, I don't have any real, real, exciting things to tell about my experience other than I was there. Uh, the teachers were there to give me what I needed. I was open to that because I knew the life that I did not want to live. So I, I think I did pretty good. Um, I, did, we didn't, I didn't have the extracurricular experience that a lot of people have and I think that um, is because of the new situation going into um, a foreign land really. Uh, because in Shepherdstown, um, the town was divided, and there was not that interaction for myself with people of other races. Mm -hmm. So um, it was a good experience for me as I as I went out into the world because I learned how to deal with things that I probably wouldn't have been able to handle otherwise. Um, I was the only black in my graduating class. And you can see how exciting that was for me. <laughs> but nevertheless, I did graduate, and I, I was open to what the teachers had to offer. So I, my life has not been that bad. Um, upon graduation, I went into the workforce. And going into the workforce, I was fortunate enough. And here I'm going to give some kudos to affirmative action. Had it not been for affirmative action, I don't know what I might have been doing because in Shepherdstown and surrounding areas there were not jobs for people with the skills that I had to offer for people of my ilk. So I went to D.C. and worked at the Treasury Department for approximately four years. City life was not for me. <laughs> so I came back to Shepherdstown and again, affirmative action and the NACP get some kudos from me um, because each job that I had was a recruitment through affirmative action. Now, affirmative action in a lot of people's eyes is just to give people jobs that were not qualified, just to get them in. I was qualified for the jobs that I had. Um, I worked um, in the school system um, as a teacher's aide for about a year, and then I went to um, Shepherd College. Being, again, the only black on campus, and that was very interesting. Uh, so, um, you know, I worked there for 40 years, and um, my experiences, um, I, I take them back to my experiences at the high school, learning how to deal with people 
of different colors and how to, um, oh, I, I need to give some kudos to my, my parents too. They, they did instill in me a sense of pride and a sense of knowing who I was. So um, I thank you. Where did I live? Of course, I said in rural Jefferson County. Like I said, I lived in rural Jefferson County, where did I work for various houses in that area, such as cleaning, cooking, and that type of thing. Where did I shop in Jefferson County? At that time, Every store that you ever needed anything out of was in Charlestown, West Virginia, on Main Street. Mm -hmm. I mean, grocery stores, clothing stores, furniture stores, anything you needed, you did not have to go any further than, just than Charlestown. Where did I go to school? I went to school at the Eagle Avenue and Pace Jackson School. And I did, I did not graduate from Paige Jackson, but I went on to do a GED out of a school out of Chicago, Illinois. I went to church at Savannah Baptist Church in Ripon. I'll always know it as Savannah Baptist Church. Um, my grandparents bought that land for the church to be built on. And my mother lived at the, in a house that was right next door to it. Whether I owned a rent, being a tenant farmer's child, you do not own. You live in. Uh, they own the house. And I hope somebody asked me some more questions about that. Um, what kind of recreation? We made our own recreation with the kids. The white kids in the neighborhood. We didn't know the difference between white and black. Because we all were equal. No matter if you live on a farm either out there now called Huntfield, or you live at one over on the other side of the road. Because we had people that was kept to us, like Rita Mickey. Uh, she was a neighbor. We had a lot of bakers and different groups of white people, but we never related to each other as far as race. What kind of recreation? We made our own recreation. We had a game to play, and like I said, in the wintertime, people used to laugh at us because we didn't have sleds. What we did was we took a scoop shovel, cut the handle off of it, and slide down the hill. How did we communicate with other people? We just did. And I can remember Jean Ann Roberts uh, always walking to her house. And then we'd go to Ripon, and then we'd go to Myerstown, or Cable Town, or whatever, to associate with other kids. Leaders in the community, I have to look at the ministers back then. The ministers had a voice. And the ministers in my life was Rody Butler and uh, Thomas Grant, who were pastors at the Savannah Baptist Church. Those people back in the day had an interest in you Everybody in your family. Nowadays, I think that's all. We're getting a crowd. That's good. It's, there's chairs in the front in case you're not too afraid to sit in the front. <laughs> You come to the front. So, so I'm holding forward. <laughs> That's church. As I, as I said in the very beginning, uh, my name is Helen Dolores Jackson Foster, but I want to recognize uh, at least two people in the audience who may have some different memories of what. Our, our child's our life was at Harper's Ferry. I have my sister Peggy, who was 11 months younger than I. Peggy, raise your hand, because she probably was going to yell when I say something wrong. <laughs> and then I have my sister Lorraine, who was a younger sister who, who didn't 
and necessarily live the same the same era that I lived in. However, she was in the household with me. And I have my, my niece, Dr. Marla McRae, who is the uh, daughter of my late sister, Linda, who has heard some of these stories from time to time. So Marla, in case I get bored, boring, just nod, that's okay. <laughs> uh, the first part of my life uh, I would like to tell you about had to do with what my parents told me. Uh, my mother and father told me I was born in a house in Halltown, West Virginia that was haunted. <laughs> and that I, I do have a birthmark on my arm that she claims is the lady that she kept seeing as she was carrying. <laughs> and we moved from Halltown to Bolivar Heights. And the reason the house is no longer there is because 340 became a bigger highway and they toured down the house where I lived. And finally, we moved to, quote, Harper's Ferry, and the house uh, that we lived in had been uh, inhabited by some other folks that my mother and father had known. However, I remember the day that a man came to our house to talk to my daddy about buying a house across the hill. Now, you need to know that in Harper's Ferry, in our communities, we went the shortcut all the way, all the time, across the hill or through the woods. We didn't go across through the streets. So the first house that I remember living in was in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. Uh, excited because my father had decided to buy us a house that we owned, and we moved everything except our ice box and our furniture by hand across the road. We carried our clothes and the dishes and everything else by hand across and in a wheelbarrow. So you, you see how close we live. Uh, we were a very close-knit community. Uh, I didn't realize that the kids who lived in Bolivar and we lived in Harper's Fair, there was a difference because we kind of did everything together. Mm -hmm. Agreeing to be on this panel uh, allowed me to uh, see the influences of my life and who I became. Uh, I would like first to give accolades to my parents, uh, Mary Frances Taylor and Daniel David Jackson who were beyond their times as far as raising 12 children in a house. Uh, there were 12 of us and I'm number three. Uh, every day, I can remember every day when I came home from school, my mother or my father would ask us what we learned. And that was important because they wanted us to know that every day we should learn something new so that we could be somebody. And then of course she would tell us that we were very, very important, we were somebody but don't think yourself is too much. And so that took a little doing, not to think you were too much, but enough <laughs> to know that you were somebody. I had two older sisters. Uh, my older sister, Catherine's deceased, and my other sister, Margaret, who really influenced me. They didn't know they were, because they were exceptional in everything they did. Uh, my sister, Catherine, I was not athletic. She was always chosen first to be on the baseball field because she could hit a home run with nothing. My sister Margaret was brilliant, is brilliant. Uh, she didn't have to study like I did. Uh, she excelled. So those two before me kind of pushed me to be who I became because I couldn't fail them. I mean, I, I didn't want to fail my mother and father, but not, that's not my sister, I had two sisters before me. So therefore I kept striving to be someone else. And the teachers that I had in school, uh, in, in the elementary school grade one through eight, uh, we had like almost like Bible study every day. So the scriptures and, 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 and the Lord's Prayer and so forth. And then when I went to high school at Paige Jackson High School, um, there I met teachers who really wanted us to excel. I mean, when I say really want you to excel, they, they were those who motivated you. They told you that you could be somebody in spite of of, of coming to a segregated school system, and in spite of riding the yellow bus every morning to school, you could be someone. And so I do, I thank my teachers, and I know one of, my, of our teachers is still living, Ms. Goldie Johnson, and, and we tried to, at Page Jackson High School Loving Life Association, tried to send her flowers to let her know that we thank her for the influence she had on our lives. There was another lady named Mrs. Victoria Goins. She was the 4-H leader. Um, she exposed us to a lot of things. The reason I can fold a sandwich 
and fold the corner of the sheets in my bed just because of this Victoria Walker. And some of you probably been through the same thing with her. Uh, she insisted that we knew that the, that the uh, knife, fork, and spoon didn't belong together. On the left, two on the right, and that the glass was in front of, of the knife. So that was very, very important. Those people, those people in our lives, I think, kind of uh, took our attention off, off of that we were segregated, we didn't have the same opportunities, but they were going to make sure that we did have those opportunities. The minister in at that the church I went was also my neighbor. So he was a friend of the family, and he was also, well, he was a friend of the family, but he didn't, he was not the minister of my church. The minister who came to our church came from White Post, Virginia. He came to, to Zion, First Zion Baptist every Sunday, and we went to Halltown on the second and the fourth Sunday. So I had church all day, all day on first, second, third, and fourth Sunday. And dare you say anything about it. <laughs> so surprising the part about it, perhaps for you, is that in Harpers Ferry and Bolivar, uh, as we call it, the white folks really were very kind to us. Uh, if, when you get a map of Harpers Ferry and Bolivar, you will see that we didn't live all in the same neighborhood. We lived all over the place. But more than that, they were very kind to us. The hand-me-downs. I mean, when the clothes came, they came to our house and bought clothes because we had, it was 12 of us. We fought over those clothes. But that was okay because we had decent things to wear to school. We had decent clothes to wear to come to school. That was grades one through eight. Of course, when we got in high school, we, we got cute, so we, you know, we didn't wear those hand-me-downs anymore. Charlestown was the place where we came for shopping and also for recreation when we got old enough to go to Venice and to go to, to uh, uh, Taylor, the Taylor. Uh, oh, you don't know where we were, yes. Taylor's Tavern. However, uh, our first introduction was to Charlestown was through our parents, because on Saturday night, they would get us dressed up, we would get in the car, and park by the tap room and watch all the activities. We weren't allowed to get out the car. We would give it one quarter, we could get, take that quarter, go to the corner, get a Coca-Cola, and come back and sit in the car and watch the parade of all you folks in Charlestown. So it was not unusual that when I got to be the age, I wanted to come to Charlestown by myself. And that's what I did. Harpersbury and Bolivar, our unique towns, as you know, it's, on, it's in the confluence of two, between two rivers, uh, the Potomac and the Shenandoah. And the being on railroad was very important because that's where my father worked at first, on the railroad, railroad in Brunswick, Maryland. And then, of course, the railroad was also important because we could watch the trains, see the people, and wave, and, and, and be in their world for a little while. Of course, Harpers Ferry, uh, the Hoppers Ferry train station was segregated. There was a white section, there was a white fountain, there was, there was a black section and a black fountain. It probably should have affected us, however, we knew what the laws were. So we went in that, that one door to go to DC, get in your seat, to wait for the train to come. Now, of course, if the train came and there's some white people to come get on before you, then you have to wait behind before you got on. I would say, I do know that the experience of, of segregation in West Virginia obviously did not harm me because when I went to New Jersey, I went to New Jersey in 1961 and taught 40 years there, taught administrator, teachers, and principals and so forth. And they always told me that I didn't act like a person who had been from a segregated school system. And I then gave accolades to my teachers and my parents and those folks back in West Virginia who taught me how to act. I knew, I knew how to act and when and where. So that was very important. I, I would say that this panel discussion is, is good for the younger folks because they don't, some of the younger folks don't realize what we have gone through to get where we are. So perhaps in, on the, in November, I mean in uh, March, Black, uh, Women's History Month, maybe we'll find something else that we could do 
so that you can understand how our black experiences have made us who we are today. Thank you. As I said before, I came from a small community, and believe it or not, here is the picture of my community. An African-American community, which was, we got all the information about it through oral history, through our families and so on. On this map, all of those places that are highlighted in yellow now belong to me. To God be the glory. I came from a family of six girls, from Jeanette Russ White to William Samuel White. And being in a family of six girls, you had hen me ups and hen me downs. If you if you stay skinny, you got hen me downs. But if you got if you grew, you had to get hen me ups, which probably from your mother or somebody. My my aunt used to make us dresses. She made us dresses out of the feed sacks that my father would bring home from the racetrack. And she designed them in such a way we felt like we were really the hit in the sack. Now, Mount Pleasant, I wish I could tell you where it got its name when it was established. I do know from my ancestor that they said this whole community was established right after the Civil War because many people after the war, we became West Virginia, had no places to work. And they wanted to still work for the farms they had worked for before, like the Crims and the different people there. So therefore, they gave them all of this land. We had two churches in this community, Ebenezer Mount Calvary now, which is a church I pastor, and Simpson, it was an African-American Episcopal church. Two churches in a small community, one school where my parent, my mother went to, not my father. My father was a city boy. So anyhow, uh, of all the people that I know that went to the school, I can only remember one person, Mr. Russell Roper, who told me that he went to that one room school in Mount Pleasant. What did they do for a living? They gardened, they butchered, they did all kinds of stuff. And we, the children, called ourselves harvesters. Why? Because we picked up the apples, brought them home. We carried salt shakers in our pockets so that we could pick up cucumbers and reddish and harvest the gardens that the people put out. Everybody was each other's caregivers. Everybody watched out for one another. There weren't a lot of cars in the neighborhood. There were very few cars and a few trucks, which we were allowed to ride on the back. You better not get on the back of a pickup truck now. But we were allowed to ride on the back of pickup trucks. It was strange, like I said, being in a family of all girls because my father was very strict. And he would come in from the racetrack and he would look around and we thought we had our little boyfriends, we thought. And he would say, I don't have any sons. And uh, they didn't get it at first. And he would say again, I don't have any sons. The next thing I know, they would get their little hats in and they'd say, get out of die. <laughs> but it was, it was very interesting because being girls, I don't know what I would have done if we had a boy in our family. We did have one that passed away when he was very young. There was what we call the weekly bath. During the week, you had a wash basin. I know y'all don't want to talk about this kind of stuff. You had a wash basin. And so, you did sponge baths. But on the weekend, you carried in that gray, big, long tub. And they filled it up, and they had this thing that looked like a donut that they put in it and hooked it in the electric, and that would heat the water. So they would, everybody would get their weekend back. I don't know how we made it, but we were clean. <laughs> so God was the Lord. And so, I mean, in Mount Pleasant, believe it or not, there were businesses. My uncle and aunt owned their own store. 
and they butchered and they cured the meat in the smokehouses and they made sausage and all those kind of things. My uncle made lawn furniture that he sold. We had our own Masonic lodge. The, 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 little, the little cornerstone is still there. It says Gideon Masonic Lodge. My mama told me that they even had a juke joint. So on Saturday night, things were happening in Mount Pleasant. There was a blacksmith shop, and there was a, there was, there was a, people had cisterns, but there was also a few hand dug wells that people had. And we all, there was no such thing as turn up the thermostat. You all had warm morning stoves. I have a sister in the audience. I hope she doesn't get embarrassed because I'm proud of the way I grew up. We had warm morning stoves that you used wood during the daytime. At night, you put in the cold because it was more expensive. And you, what you call, banked it for the night. And in the morning, you shook it down and let it start breathing again. And that kept you warm in your houses and stuff. And it was amazing. It was amazing. When you came home from school, you took off your school clothes and put on your work clothes. I learned how to split wood, hang the clothes on the line, use an old ringer washer. All those things were natural. They weren't something that there was nobody in the house that got to do things. When you butchered, you made apple butter, you, you canned tomatoes and peaches and all that kind of stuff. And when springtime came, you went out and cut dry land cress, coat greens and all that kind of stuff. That kept us healthy. We ate. And for the doctors, you didn't go to no doctor. You lined up the six of you and got cut a little oil. <laughs> You want to get it. Mama didn't have to set on us, but she had that eye. And when she would look at you in a certain way, you opened your mouth. And, and you swallowed it before you left her presence. And we made apple butter. We lived in the orchard part of the way. So we had apple everything. Fried apples, apple dumplings, apple fritters, everything. So we started nicknaming ourselves Apple Dumpling Gang. My father was not a disciplinary. My mother did all the disciplinary. Yes. She got the switches that she made you get to make you to whip yourself. So you better bring one that's worthy because if you brought one that broke, you got to go back and get another. My dad believed in a type of punishment for if you weren't listening, he'd give you punishment. The punishments could be anything from the six white girls, because white was our last name, not our color. <laughs> to go out on the front porch with your car coats on in the summertime, tie up and wave at the traffic. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't called child abuse. It was the way you were disciplined because you knew better. You knew better. And to keep you extra warm at night, on those warm morning stoves, we had bricks. And you took the bricks, and you put them on the stove, and when they got hot, some of y'all ain't gonna ever admit to none of this, but I'm proud. I ain't saying it loud, I'm proud. I'm proud. But uh, you wrapped them up in, in newspaper, and then you wrapped them in old blankets. You put them in the bottom of your bed, and they kept your feet warm during the night. Now, I'm probably the youngest of this whole group, but I believe I lived in the era that they lived in too, because nothing changed, it was all the same. You walked where you went to take the shortcut, you went up the railroad track, and you know, you did everything. We would pick berries in a king surf can that had a handle on it, and sell them back to the people's property that we had picked. <laughs> You had to learn to become an entrepreneur very early in your life. I'm serious. I mean, you, you did all of that stuff, and it gave you a sense of somebody. Because when you heard the story of how all this land was given to your ancestors for free, for them to maintain it, right today, Mount Pleasant does not have a plot 
in the in the clerk's office because all of the land was stepped off. He stepped it off. Those of us who had bought land later and had it surveyed, now we have plaques that go with it. Beforehand, there was this fence, this fence, this nail in this tree, this rock that was right here, all of those things. There's so much that I could tell you about me growing up, but I tell you what, I shall never forget. And to finish up, I'll say this. I tell those stories to my boys, and this is the response I get. Mom, y'all are poor. <laughs> <laughs> and they would say, you keep saying those were the good old days. I said they were the good old days, and when you learn that you can't come in the house and turn my thermostat up and down when you want to, stand in my, open up my refrigerator and look till the temperature goes down, and throw away stuff that I paid good money for, you will have something to say about the good old days. I'm Julia Downing. I was born in Charlestown, West Virginia, 1928. Good old days. I was born on West Washington Street near Potato Hill. Some of you might know where Potato Hill is. Yes. <laughs> I was a child. I, when I was a child, I lived on Southwest Street. Some of you know where Southwest Street is. I lived in Ransom. I lived on Big End and on Potato Hill. I don't like this thing. <laughs> when I stayed in Markham, Virginia, where my mother was born, I used to walk to school with my Uncle Robert so that someone would babysit me while my mother would be at work. This was before I was old enough to go to school. My Uncle Robert was nine years older than I. My Aunt Elizabeth Gaskin taught school. It was a one-room school. And believe it or not, if you go to Markham, Virginia today, that school is still standing. <laughs> when I started first grade at Eagle Avenue, I lived on Mill Lane, which was part of Eagle Avenue. There was a big water wheel at the mill. I was 10 years old when we first got electric. That was a big thing back there. We didn't get electric. Before then, we used oil lamps. We lived in Ransom. Then near the old harness factory in the same, and in the same house where my future husband was born. Now the harness factory is now where the uh, university is in Ransom. That was the harness factory where they used to make harnesses for horses. Oh. My mother didn't have a problem getting a place for us to live because I was an only child. Back in the day, you know, if you had a lot of children, it was hard to get a house. So. We were fortunate enough to me to live where I did live. <laughs> I walked to Eagle Avenue School from Big End. Sometimes my teacher, Sorrel Craven, would rub my hands because they would be so cold. She called me her little bunny rabbit. Now, you might remember Ruth Craven. She would be the uh, daughter-in-law of uh -huh. I was able to spend summers at my Uncle Carl's in Virginia or half of the summer with my uncles in Washington, D.C. At first, Eagle Avenue School only went to the eighth grade. Ninth to the twelfth grade, you had to go to Hoppers Ferry. You go to what you call oh, store, store College. College. Yes, and you were smart then. then, then. <laughs> if you could afford it, you had to pay. Oh. Or move away and stay without a town family where school went to the twelfth grade. Mm -hmm. Later rooms were added to Eagle Avenue School for 9th to the 12th grade. The new part was called Paige Jackson after the principal that we had at one time. My mother did domestic work. My first job was cleaning out a chicken house for 50 cents for a family that owned the ice plant. They own that plant today. I was nine years old then. As a child, I would also babysit. That worked hard. <laughs> As children, we would go to the movies, which was segregated. We would go upstairs, and the white would be downstairs. The opera house was the opposite. 
Opera House right today. Go, we go uh, downstairs and they go upstairs. It's just the opposite. The Opera House would have vaudeville shows. I don't know if any of y'all any are old enough to know what a vaudeville show is. Oh, that was a day. <laughs> That was the shit. <laughs> People from our communities would, would perform, like Buck Jackson, and his, he had a band. He lived out in Ransom. A lady named Celestine Wood, she would sing, and a man named P.B. Johnson. He would be the comedian. I could drive as a young woman and would take neighbors to places like doctor's appointments. The men worked. From the late 1940s until the 50s and 60s, I alone with my husband raised our five children and the two nephews of my deceased sister-in-law. I catered with my mother. Later, I worked at the clubhouse at the racetrack, at Legacy Department Store, and at Newberry's. Yeah. My last job was at Courthouse. Most of you remember me, yeah. the town crier. Uh -huh. <laughs> that's, that's me, town crier. I moved into my new home on Potato Hill in 1960 when I was 32. My husband was 35. I have lived in my home ever since. Now that home that I live in, my husband built that. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I had a, uh, what you call, Washington Post. You used to get the blueprints out of the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. And every Sunday, we would look at them. Mm -hmm. And I picked out one. Mm -hmm. He said, you pick it, I'll build it. Oh. <laughs> so one word led to another. I couldn't drive a car. I said, well, if you build a house, I'll drive a car. <laughs> so that's the way that went. He built the house, and I learned how to drive a car. Right. <laughs> and uh, I'm in that house right today. Mm -hmm. Let's see, yeah. I was I was den mother for Boy Scouts for forty uh, troop forty two. I had the first integrated troop in Charlestown, the first one for Boy Scouts. We met at our home. I was a den mother for eight years. I was the only woman town crier to open a closed election at the courthouse. I continued to be a member of the Eastern Stars, Deborah Chapter Number Thirty Eight, American Legion Auxiliary Unit One Hundred Two and had served on committees and had various offices at my church. I also reached my goal of owning two racehorses. servants in the community and the society at large. Mm -hmm. And they continue, they continue at their ages mm -hmm. to work in the community. And now we will open up discussion among the panelists as well as questions from the audience. <coughs> oh. okay. Look at the hands going. My name is Pamela and um, Alice Hunter is my pastor. And I'm not from uh, this area, but I just moved up here uh, last year. But I, I moved up here from Frederick, but I was driving from Frederick to up here for the last eight years going to church. But um, uh, as uh, the, the lady in the yellow was talking about, and, and Pastor too was talking about the wood stove, um, <laughs> and my father got cussed at me when I was young, and we moved to my grandmother's house in Jessup. And my grandmother had a wood stove. And y'all kept talking about that wood stove. And I was just sitting here, yep, because I was the oldest girl, and I used to have to make the fires. And, um, and, and I didn't know how, because I, I was a city girl. And then once I started doing it, it became natural. You know what I mean? So my father would chop the wood and would leave all the wood on the porch. And so I would put the paper down. And when he would show me what the kindling was, then I put the kindling, kindling in there. And, I, and then I put the lighter logs in and light it. Once the fire got up, then I started throwing them heavy jokers in there. And then he was saying about the cold. My father would go to Baltimore and get the cold. 
that stove would get so hot at night, it would have <laughs> condensation on the refrigerator. We would have to get the pans, put all in the ups because it's so hot. And this was in the 70s. Okay, this was in the 70s. You know, so, because my grandmother's house didn't have heat in it. You know, and so, you, 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 you know, and it was, um, I liked it like that, it was comfortable, and I never had that kind of heat ever since. You know, and it was, it was very comfortable, it was very comfortable, and I, I, I kind of like that way of living, you know. Those people out there, they just made that area Columbia, so you had the people with the big bougie swall houses, and, and I felt kind of shame because we was living in my grandma's old house. But I tell you what, they was coming in my our house every morning, waiting for that school bus, getting that, getting that heat. <laughs> but um, I love that way of life, and um, it's so comforting, and so uh, the humbleness of it, you, you know. And so um, I'm canning now, and I go past. I said. My aunt did it for years, and I said, I said, I don't need the can. I said, it's just the, the act of it, you know. Excuse um, me, excuse me. Uh, right now, yeah, you're passing out maps. There should be four pages. Okay. And but um, I just want to say I appreciate everything the lady said. Okay. And so we're going to pass out the map so that you can uh, have a visual of the areas that these women are talking about. So we're going to pass them out. There should be four maps, a cover sheet that lists the communities, and then a breakdown of the African American uh, communities in each town. So we're going to pass that out. Mr. Rockford has a question. I have a question for Junior May. I knew that. <laughs> you, were you found talking about West Street, what happened down West Street, what bands came in? Yes. What took place on Saturday back in the 40s and children's circuit and so forth? Yes. You, but you want to Can name you talk me? about it? What, what, what was down there? What was oh, what's that? some of the bands that were down there? Uh, let me see. <clears throat> All right, now let's see. Well, I can Tina the turn. I had breakfast with him down on that street. That's the main thing. I can Tina the turn. There was a little restaurant down there called Skinny Helm. Uh, it's an empty uh, lot right there now. Say right where the tap room was. Those who know where the tap room was, main tap room. As you cross the street, that empty lot. That was a restaurant there. And before you get there, there was a, a Pete Lee pool hall. We're on West Street now. You know where we're at on West Street? Southwest Street. Southwest Street. Fisherman oh. Hall is. Fisherman oh. Hall, before you get out. Like you're going to save a lot. Oh. Okay, that street, like you're going to save a lot. Uh, we had uh, Payne's Tap Room down there, and we had uh, Otis Redden. He stayed, uh, anybody remember Otis Red? Yeah. He, 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 he stayed at the corner of where I lived, down there where the Smith lived. That's where he stayed at. And it's now Martin Luther King Avenue. And there was a lot of, a lot of people back in the day that, uh, Lordy, Lordy, Miss Claudia and all them. Yeah. Back in my day, but see, we got to the point when you got TV, you know, then they don't stay with you no more. Mm -hmm. They would be in Charlestown or the place called uh, it's Rainbow Inn now. You know where the Rainbow is? Uh, it is. Uh, yeah. Okay, that, that was the place for us at one time. And so they got so that when they get to DC and go get on TV, then you couldn't afford them anymore. Mm -hmm. You see, once they got the TV, but we had Lord and Miss Carter, Tina, Tyson, Tina Turner, you name it. We had, and I danced with Pat Domino. <laughs> <laughs> that, that lady, my day, I danced with Pat Domino, and he sang to me, I got my three on Blueberry Hill. Oh, those were the days. Those were the days. Yeah, you, you have to pay, you have to pay them. Did that answer you? Miss Downing, yeah. my question to you is, you said you was the um, prior at the courthouse. Yes. Yeah. Could you demonstrate to us? Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. uh, As, uh, I would like to 
say that um, I appreciate with much gratitude from each one of you the empowerment that you bring with you mm -hmm. and that God must have been first in all yes. of your upbringing. Yes. Mm -hmm. With all that being said, during the period of change in the society, what stood out as the most significant change compared I'm gonna, to... I'm going to ask Alice, excuse me, as was Alice in school, uh, Pastor Hunter, if she would start with the transition from going to, from a segregated school to an integrated school, and then what would be the response? Um, that was hard for me because if I had, I was at Pace Jackson, and when the integration took place, or while I was away during the summertime, I came back, my school was closed. Why did it hurt? If we had stayed at Pace Jackson, I would have been the valedictorian or salutevictorian of my class. Wow. So when we integrated, that put you way to the back of the line, but I didn't stop trying to learn. Uh -huh. yeah. I, I would like to um, help you to understand what it was like to have friends in the neighborhood who were white. You went to Grand View Elementary School, grades one through eight. But when we went to high school, we rode a yellow bus, and they met us when the bus got back to Harper's Fair. That's the kind of friendships we had. They understood that they went to separate schools, but they were still our friends. But my education was K through my K, first grade in the sandbox, through eight at Grand View Elementary School, nine through 12 at Pace Jackson High School, and in 1955, the year I graduated high school, remember the Supreme Court decision was in 1954. Store College, which would have been the college that I would have attended, closed. It took my two sisters, Catherine and Margaret, were at Store College, and when I started school in 1955 at Shepherd College, now University, the three of us went to school. we commuted together. The three of us went together. And that was so much different. Uh, you need to understand that uh, when we went to Shepherd, they didn't want us. They told us to go back to our own schools. But we had no schools to go back to. So there was a lot of, of, of mistreatment. But at Georgia probably remember, they had the minstrel shows every year, the black faces and Al Joseph and so forth and so on. And they didn't think anything about that until we went to the president and told him how it made us feel. And then he stopped it and they hated him. Uh, because he stopped their, their, their reason to earn money for the fraternities. And also, like, we could not join the sorority. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm so glad I'm, I belong to Delta Sigma Theta. All right? Yeah. 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 Because they had the college life with the sorority, which makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. And we had to commute every day. Uh, the most, I guess, the, the most unfair thing they did to us was when it came lunchtime, each one of them would go into the uh, Rams Den and sit at a table mm. so that we could not sit. Mm. So we had to eat in our cars. Mm. Sunshine, no matter what, we ate in our cars. Oh, Therefore, they thought it was okay until someone noticed that this was happening. Mm. That someone was not of our color, it was like a, a white professor. That he noticed that they, went, they did this every day to us. Mm -hmm. to us. So I think George might have been the first group of people to go to, to, to Shepherd, the first year, 54. And we came, no, you went to 55 too. Yeah, okay, oh, dear. But um, <laughs> there, there were, like, I guess there were waves of us coming. You know, the first wave came like in, like in 54 when Charles Jackson went, and then in 55 was a big wave of people come. And finally, after enough blacks came onto the campus, we began, we began to have some equality. Mm -hmm. But Shepherd College, there, there were kind professors there, and that's the reason also why I became a teacher and went moved to New Jersey mm -hmm. to teach. Mm -hmm. So, education. I, I want to ask uh, Ms. Branson to talk a, a little bit about her father uh, and his role in Jefferson County, uh, in Shepherdstown, and the influence that he had on you, your sisters, and brothers, and the community in general. Um, my father was one of the um, 
people who was not allowed or didn't have the opportunity <coughs> to go to school in Shepherdstown because there was no high school in Shepherdstown for African Americans. So my father did a commute to Stewart College. And in order for him to go to school, because the family didn't have any money, he had to work. Um, my father uh, not only did store college as um, his uh, graduate, but he went there for the normal school, mm -hmm. um, grades 8 through 12. Mm -hmm. So he, he traveled up and down the road <coughs> for a lot of years. But um, he, um, he was a hard worker, and he was a very intelligent man. Um, he had a desire to help people. So when he graduated from college, of course, um, again, it was hard finding teaching positions. So he, he, he graduated, uh, his, his, his degree was in teaching secondary education. So he went to Luray, Virginia, and he worked there for only a year. No, he worked there for a couple years. The family moved with him and lived there one year, and then he came back to Shepherdstown. And coming back to Shepherdstown again, he did not go into the teaching profession because of the availability. So he worked at the VA center in Martinsburg until his retirement. Mm -hmm. But during his um, during his career, his um, his life, he was um, very interested in the welfare of other people, of other African Americans, especially in the area of employment. So he was instrumental in negotiating getting. Um, African Americans employed at General Motors. He was also someone who was interested in politics. So he served um, on the Shepherdstown Council for 26 years. Mm -hmm. However, during, during, one, one, during that period, there was a break uh, where he was not a part of the council. He uh, wanted to be the recorder. You know, the recorder is next to the mayor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Serving all those years, he did not, he was not voted in as a recorder. Mm -hmm. But he was very instrumental, a lot of people don't know, in being the man <coughs> behind the scenes in helping the mayors. And I think if you talk to any of the former mayors of Shepherdstown, they will tell you how instrumental he was in helping them. He was parliamentarian, so he, he stayed by the rules. He used uh, Robert's rule of order. He was, um, uh, I mean, he was a firm believer in that. So uh, he was very instrumental in what I did uh, in persevering, even at, I, I see it as not in adversity now, but then being the only African American um, in my class to graduate, it was, um, and, I, and I try to tell uh, children now when I speak to them and, and they don't want to learn, I said, you know, the teacher is there to teach you. It doesn't matter whether they show an interest in you at all. They're there to teach. If they're giving it to someone else, you can absorb that information, which is what I did. Because um, if you can imagine being in a classroom and feeling like you're not there, <laughs> I don't know how else to put that. But I knew I knew what I did not want to do. And in order to at least attempt to do some things that I wanted to do, I had to be able to uh, communicate and I had to have some knowledge of what I wanted to do. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I have one more question before I get to the ask Mrs. Jeffries. Uh, what influence did her childhood and uh, life experiences in the community have on her in becoming an active, long-term mm -hmm. member in the NAACP? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, like I said, um, my father was a tenant farmer. You know what that is? Mm -hmm. So he never owned and he never rented. I think my mother and father taught me the importance of moving forward, mm -hmm. the basic things in life. Because when I moved to town, the only thing that I was able to do was kitchen work, whether it be a home, in a home or in a restaurant. And that went on for a number of years. But my father was respected in the community, no matter what he did, where he went. And of course, my mother was one person who could do anything because of my father's name. Because mm -hmm. your name means a lot. Um, 
being a, a tenant farmer's daughter, we never had playtime. When we came home, we had to go to work. Before we went to school, we had to do work on the farm. And of course, when my dad got sick, we had to do work on the farm. If he didn't work on the farm, you could lose your house. And then of course, when he died, we had to do because nobody wanted to do the farm work. Now my oldest brother, he went to the orchard. My youngest brother, he went with Dr. Kaiser. My sister, she went and worked in a restaurant. Did all those things, but if you don't have people in your family who can work on a farm, you lose your housing. Wow. And of course, we moved to town. And my mother and I, of course, searched our places to work. But the amazing things was going to work in Legacy. Mm -hmm. I was determined to work in a store. And I got there, and the first thing they gave me was a job in the back room. Mm -hmm. And I kept saying, Lord, this can't last for so long. Mm -hmm. But you hang in there. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what my mother and father told me. You hang in there in these situations. And I hung in there, and finally they hired me as a salesperson. And I stayed with them until they closed. And that was in 73. Julia, I think, and some of them decided they were getting out ahead of time. <laughs> but I hung in there. And when I, when the doors closed on that Saturday, Monday I started looking for a job. And I had a job on Wednesday. When I went to work at Herbal Graphics and stayed there for 30 years. So you have to have determination. You have to. And of course I can relate to what, what they're saying. Because when we were young, like I said, it was working before we left, and it's work when we got home. But in the summer, it was planting time, weeding time, plucking up, canning. You name it, we had to do it. Getting coal, getting wood. We had to do all these things to assist our mother, you know, because a tenant farmer works 24-7. You know, you don't have no time for yourself. You know, so we had to pick up slack to help our mother get And I can remember butchering time. Oh, boy. They canned everything. They canned the sausage. I can remember the tenderloin. <coughs> Every vegetable that you ever grew went into a jar. <laughs> it went into a jar because we didn't have the opportunity to come to town like you do today to get stuff. If you didn't can it, you would be lost in the way. Yes. Yes. Only thing I can remember my mother coming to town for was maybe sugar. Because we made our own butter. You know, we did have flour. They did give us flour. But, uh, you know, the lard, all that stuff, you got to have butchering time. You know. And as far as transportation, we rode the Greyhound bus. There used to be a Greyhound bus that came huh. from Winchester to Burnville to Charleston. Oh, wow. yeah. My mother and I would get on the bus, wow. of course, to go to the back, come in town and get our groceries, and get back on the bus, and go to the back, and then when we got to our stop, we'd get off and we came home. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't realize that was a Greyhound bus back then. Mm -hmm. That was in, in the early 50s. Yeah. Yeah. NAACP, how did you start? How, do I, how did I start? NAACP. Mr. Damage. Mr. Damage came to my residence at 429 South Broad Street. Who was the principal Street. at Page Jackson? Excuse me. The make that connection. And he walked up to me and he said, we need a secretary. And I know you can do it. And I paused. <laughs> and I said, but you know, in my heart, you had to have respect for Mr. Damage. Yes, sir. No matter what he said to you. So that's what I got started in that. Been in it ever since. Done all kinds, all kinds of classes. Did a lot of travel. And I've enjoyed it. You can give them an idea of how many years when you said every since. How long have you been a member? 50 plus years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know you had a question. You still have yeah. Uh, I was wondering who, if 
any body had, I guess, during integration, uh, much if any, many if any, teachers that that they considered really knowledgeable and empathetic. I read recently in a uh, an education magazine. I'm not an educator, but my daughter is, and. Uh, and I understand that uh, uh, white racists defeated some of the integration by making sure that the better educators or that educators that were more sensitive to African Americans were kind of left go from the schools, especially those with power principles and that kind of thing, were left go during integration. Uh, African Americans who, during segregation, again segregated, but they, they their teachers were sensitive to them. And, and yes. if that makes any yes. sense, yes. did yes. things kind of reverse yes. themselves? Yes, because my teachers in high school were from the South. Uh, I, I remember they took our class, class of 55, the first class to go anywhere. We went to Atlanta, Georgia, because they wanted to show us what it, what it meant to be really to live in the South. Mm -hmm. So they came from the South because they couldn't get a job there, mm -hmm. but they could get a job here in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about segregation. But I understand when the schools were integrated, some of the teachers were passed over. No, I don't know. Uh, they had to go to another state to get a job or what have you. That's what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah uh, I, I understand that some of the, you know, there's black educators today that look back on their experiences and they say, look, you know, strangely enough, I actually like the black schools better because I was able to converse with my teachers, and they oh, yeah. respected me. Mm -hmm. uh, does that make any sense? The difference mm -hmm. being, when you were in the segregated schools, your teacher knew your parents, mm -hmm. and they had authority over you in yeah. such a way that they could discipline you, yeah. and then they would call your parents, and then they would do it again. <laughs> <laughs> so they were like parents to us, more so than teachers. But they taught in such a way, they opened it up in such a way, you wanted to learn more. You wanted to get more. And they took that time. Every last teacher, they took that time. And they told us their history, which made us want our history to be better. And did that change significantly for you? So oh, yes. You, yes. When, when my school closed, all of my teachers went to the schools too. Only the ones that retired did not go into the uh, new schools. They were there and the new students at those schools, they learned to love Miss Lewis and, and Jim Taylor and all the teachers that went over, Mr. Flemings and Mrs. Flemings, they learned to love them because they carried something special. And there's no way you can stop the special because <laughs> it just, yeah. I'd like to add something. Okay. That's good. <laughs> when my daughter was young and had to go to school, I did not send her to the black school. I sent her to the white school, which was right there. And I found white, that white teacher there had compassion and concern for her. She, up, she had problems in her reading in other classes. And that white teacher mentored her to get her up to steam. I can say that for the, for the teachers my daughter had in the white school. Because if I had sent her to the black schools, she would have to pass the white school and go to another school, which made, meant walking. So I can vouch for that white teacher, those white teachers that mentored my daughter. We have another, yeah, from the early segregation, 62, 63. They weren't prepared for that. The bus would ride right past us. 
and we still had to walk to school. Winter, summer, dresses, no pants. So it wasn't all good. Tell them. It wasn't it wasn't all good. You know? I didn't have a black teacher the whole time I was in junior high or high school. You know? So it wasn't all good. We did what we did because we had to. You know, I never had a teacher to call me to the side if I didn't know something. I never had anybody explain it to me. You got it or you didn't. You know, or you go home and your parents will help you. It's five years between me and my sister. I was in school five years before her. And the same thing was going on. You know, we go, we're in band. I have some friends here. We were in band. We had first and second year. When they integrated, we had last year. And what we do, we would challenge each other. So I would have last this time, she have next to last. Then the next time, we switch. Because they never called on us. They never called on us. We never got a solo. You know, so it wasn't all good. And I'm 72 years old, and it still hurts me. Because I was 12, 13, 14, up until 17 years old. So it wasn't all good. I wasn't good enough to be a cheerleader or anything. No, you, you back, we didn't have anybody on the football team, no major rats, you know, so, you know, it's out. <laughs> and I felt good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Tori. When you were talking about uh, the opera house, when you were talking about how um, either the white set of top or the black set at the bottom or the black set of top, and the white set at the bottom, do you remember what door you went in? What did you say? What door? What door? The side door? door. Yeah. The side door. And the side door is still there. Mm -hmm. There's two more questions. This we had. My mind is not a question. My mind is pretty much a statement. I come from the North. I was raised in Philadelphia. A lot of the things that were said here, pretty much, we went through. We just didn't go through it the same degree. Mm -hmm. When they went and they segregated the school, it was one of the most horrific things that mm -hmm. I think the North had ever experienced. And there was a lot of brutality on the children that had to go through it. I was blessed enough to not to have the experience. And some of the hate that went on, went on amongst ourselves. We're in, instead of appreciating one another, we fought one another. When I went to school, that was a time when they were starting to, one school hated the girls in the other school, and they wanted to kill them, or they wanted to cut up their feet, cut up their hair, just because their hair was a certain way, or their skin color was a certain way. So segregation has been all around. I did experience for myself, my grandmother, one of the most horrific things that I've ever met. And yet I didn't understand it then. I know it now because we went into a restaurant and my grandmother wanted to be served. Now my grandmother is one of those light, bright, nearly white people. She always thought of herself as white, in mm. fact, I grew up believing she was white until she passed away and her birth certificate said African American. When we went in the restaurant, she had the good hair and everything. So there was no reason to suspect that she was not who she thought she was. But yet, they would not serve her. They would not serve her. And I didn't understand it. And yet, she was dressed as my grandmother believed in Lloyd Taylor's and all the other high sophisticated um, stores. And yet, we did not serve her. Well, she did manage to get that lady's job because it was at a time when there was not supposed to be segregation. But I said all that to say this, 
I appreciate what I learned here because when I came here, I learned a lot about African Americans and the history of West Virginia, especially where we are in Mount Pleasant and all the things that have been established in Mount Pleasant. Thank you. I said that. Uh, Question, but we really don't have time. We're going to have to close and we're going to hang around for 15 minutes or so and then you can ask individually uh, people that you may want to ask questions. So anyway, I hope that by listening to our panelists that not only did you enjoy what they had to say, but that you also were enlightened by what they had to say. Thank you. Wait a minute. No, Jane has those. I just wanted to reiterate that thank you for coming. Those of you who want to leave can, and uh, those who want to stay can for uh, a short time. Or some people are exhausted. <laughs> we, have, we have some thank yous. I forgot. Yes. Lori Simmons. Uh, Lori Simmons, who did the maps. And also, we need to thank Jane and Sarah. Yes. For their work. Yes.